My name's Adam Spring, and this is a remotely interested tribute to Dave Needle. Now, the recordings that you're about to hear were taken in January of 2015. I met Dave a month later in San Francisco, which, looking at the timestamps of the photographs from that time, was literally almost a year to the date of his death. Now, Dave and I, over a period of time, became very good friends, and I'm going to miss him dearly. I'm going to miss my conversations with him. When I found out that he passed away from Aaron Rochetta, who was on one of my podcast episodes, if you want to go back and take a look, yeah, I broke down immediately. There, there was only one Dave Needle, and despite his many accomplishments, whether you're looking at the stuff that he did with the Amiga, the Atari Lynx and the 3DO, which he obviously did with RJ Michael, and with a little help from some of his other Amiga friends as well, nothing that he did compares to the man himself. He was just a brilliant and warm human being, and he was always thinking about others. And that's the thing that I'm really going to miss most about Dave. Now, I would also like to thank Ravi Habit and Dan Wood of the Retro Hour because they were kind enough to play the audio from a video that I did of Dave for the Amiga 30 event. And listening to that actually reminded me, oh, wait a minute, I have actually got some audio of Dave somewhere. So in a weird kind of way, you can kind of thank them for me remembering that I had this. So without further ado, I will pass you over to Dave. There won't be some concluding remarks to this for obvious reasons, but there will be some snippets at the end after the outros that were the bits that I couldn't necessarily put in because of flow, but I wanted them to get out there because I thought it was useful for them to be out there. Anyway, without further ado, I will leave you with Dave Needle. Um, one of the great difficulties we had after Commodore took over was this whole concept of an IBM bus, uh, a PC bus of some kind in the machine. Along with that was PC compatibility in terms of software. And the reason that there was a gigantic difficulty, and who knows if we were right or not, it's hard to say, um, the basic feeling was that if you have a software developer who's got limited resources and limited budget and Christmas comes when it comes and there's always a calendar and he's going to write a piece of software for a PC that he'll sell 100,000 copies or a piece of software for an Amiga that he might sell 10,000 copies, um, which one is he spending his resources on? Um, and the answer was clearly that he would write it for the PC. But a lot of them would still want to do something for the Amiga. So they would be brave and, and outgoing and write something for the Amiga, which is what we needed to get the machine alive. Nobody buys the hardware. People buy the applications. And so the hardware is just a platform that runs the applications. And as a hardware designer, that's my job, to design and create a hardware platform that lets the software applications that we dream about have a place to run and to run well and to make it easy to develop. Um, so what we were facing was the current situation of the guys who were brave enough would write stuff for Amiga. And they'd write great stuff, some of them were, but they'd write great stuff. And that's what would help sell Amigas and get this to grow. But if you made it IBM compatible so that the piece of software you wrote would work both on PCs and on an Amiga, then the creation of Amiga great software would evaporate. Almost nobody would spend their resources to write something specific for Amiga that wasn't hampered by all the IBM PC constraints when with a similar amount of energy and expense they could write a piece of software that would run on both machines. So sure, there'd be PC software that ran on the Amiga, but that wouldn't be a reason for people to go buy the Amiga. And so we felt it would really, really hurt hardware sales, which would then, of course, hurt all of it. Because if there aren't enough units out there, people stop writing software for it. And so that's the battle that we had with Commodore to keep it from ever being PC compatible. Um, we felt it was just only going to be a negative. Who knows if we're right, but that was the business of whether or not you put in a PCI bus and what do you do for other kinds of expandability. Also, back then, I don't think we at Amiga had a vision of expandability in the same way that the PC world expanded. Um, the whole concept of plugging cards in uh, got to be pretty interesting. Yeah, we made an expansion bus. Yeah, you could put memory on the side because there was never enough memory, and you can put in external disk drives. Um, and then there was some kind of frame grabber, I think, that went on the side. I don't remember. 
there was a tower. There were lots of pieces of hardware that people came up with that you were able to use on your Amiga, uh, which we thought was pretty good. Uh, but I don't, I don't remember actually having a drive to having a proper bus like a PCI bus. Okay. Inside the machine. It happened long after I was gone, so I don't know. Okay. In terms of sort of like J minor, um, did uh, am I right in perceiving that he drew a lot of influence from his experience in designing games systems and things like that? Did 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 that yes, a lot of that go in? Yes, he did. Do you have the story of who actually invented the Amiga? No, I don't. Um, it's hard to do without animation. Are you talking about Mitchy? Yes, Mitchie. Yeah, I've seen so I've seen the video of you guys around in nineteen ninety four where you're basically doing the dog impression of he'd look down at the dog and the dog would go. <laughs> yes, that's the story. That's yeah. the story, uh -huh. is it? Oh, okay. The, yeah, because isn't the uh, the paw print actually in, inside of the original um, one thousand yes, box, is. isn't it? Yeah, as is Jill Pillow. Um, do you know the Jill Pillow story? I do not. I do not know. Um, it's a story you should get from RJ and Dale because they were the ones. Um, and the story was just so incredibly good that when we were making the uh, the names to go inside, I also wrote in Joe Pillow. Joe Pillow was a creation on an airplane. Um, and it was such a wonderful, funny story. And then it got backed up by physical evidence. It was just great. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. RJ and, and Dale were, uh, I think it was RJ. No, I know it was Dale, but I think it was also RJ, um, were there. Um, and it was such a delightful, fun story um, that we couldn't resist it. Joe Pillow was great. And so his initials are in there also. Um, as are, let's see, so one of the design engineers put in his name in English and Chinese. And he's not Chinese in any way. He's a straight, ordinary white guy. But he had the hop for a Chinese girl, and so he learned how to speak and write in Chinese. Oh, good plan. So what is the story of Joe Pillow then? Do tell me. So I'll tell you quickly, but it's more fun from them. Uh, RJ and Dale are on an airplane coming back from somewhere. They get on the airplane, and it looks crowded, and they decide they don't really want to be squished in with anybody, so they take uh, the window and the aisle seat, leaving the center seat empty, but he puts his backpack, Dale's, I think it's Dale's backpack, he puts it in that seat. Um, and the stewardess uh, is counting all the empty seats so they can bring the rest of the people on, and she doesn't count it as an empty seat. It stays with the backpack. And they think this is just hysterical. Um, then as the flight, somewhere in the flight, I don't remember the detail, they take a pillow, one of the airplane pillows, and they prop it up on top of the backpack as Joe Pillow's head. <laughs> um, and this is hysterical. The stewardess is pissed. The doors are closed. The plane is taken off. There was an extra seat that could have had a passenger in it, and it's got this pillow and backpack in it. She's really mad at them. Um, as they're getting off the plane, they're carrying Joe Pillow off. They've got the backpack between their arms and the pillow on top of it, and they're walking off the plane with Joe Pillow uh, as a human. It's very funny. And the stewardess, who was all this pissed, grabs the pillow and takes it away from them. They come back and tell us the story, and we're laughing at how much fun it is. They do a much better job than I'm doing of telling the story. Um, and we're giggling at whether or not it's real because it's easily a made-up story and stuff. And then one of the other passengers, a few rows up, took pictures of Joe Pillow and sent them to Amiga. And so we had the photographic evidence of the whole story. It was great. That's, um, I mean, I, and that's Joe Pillow. I mean, that's, that's interesting because one of the things I really got from that sort of retrospective where you had all the team around while Jay was still alive from the 94, the 94 video is something that he seemed to have really instilled was an actual culture within the original Amiga setup, you know, and I find that very interesting because it seems as though as well that like all of you guys were actually breathing sort of a, a material culture life into the actual product as well, you know, whether it was like you were saying, having inscriptions on the inside of the actual um, the actual sort of like plastic or even calling the chips, you know, Denise, Paula, etc, etc. It seems as though to me that you guys really did cross the line between art and science which it seems as though all the great people in sort of the engineering world seem to do that quite well, whether it's someone like Ed Catmull or somebody like Doug Engelbart. You, there always seems to be this element of breathing very much a philosophy into the, into the product. Was that, was that conscious or was that, that not conscious? Oh, very interesting question. Um, yes, there was immense art. There was family. This was our family. Mm. We ate together. We went on trips together. We went river rafting. We did a 
amazing, fun stuff together. We lived in those offices. There were times during the crunch that we slept at the office, and our wives came and brought clothes and food. Uh, and they joined in, in the work and in the joy of this creation. It was so amazingly close. Uh, most of us are still friends. Um, most of us still talk to each other from time to time, even though we're physically separated. A couple of times a year, there's some kind of an event, and we gather up, and we all see each other and see each other's families and have fun. It is still a family. Uh, it was sad when Dave Morse died. Uh, because he was still part, a uh, major part, of the overall family. We wear our Amiga jackets with pride when we go somewhere. It is still solid. And the answer, the answer to your question about was it conscious um, is a very interesting question because it's not whether it was conscious or unconscious. It was obvious and natural. Of course this is how you do it. Of course this is what we put in there. Of course we go for the better part. Um, I don't think we ever said the words, oh, you know, we ought to do things that have more heart or have more expandability or more of this. It was, no, this is, this is what we should be doing. This is what this machine ought to have as part of everyone's inner feelings. So if you want to call that conscious, it's fine, but I don't, wouldn't call it deliberate or planned. It just was the way the team was. It's how the people thought and how they felt and how they wanted things to be. So I don't know what kind of title to give that, but that's the way we felt about it. Yeah. I mean, I just thought it was interesting because, again, c coming back to that interview that I watched of you guys, it was very interesting to see Jay Miner say it's very important to allow people to be different. That's why I wondered yeah. whether there was a conscious effort there because he seemed like somebody that was incredibly brilliant from an engineering standpoint, but he was also a very human being as well. So I was just, I was kind of wondering whether you had the right person at the helm there that was just naturally just instilling the right values, so to speak, you know, of like, this is just, this is what we'll do type thing, you know? The values, I think, came from David Morse. He was a quiet man and very clear in his mind how things ought to be, not just from the technology. Uh, not just from the architecture of the block diagram of the machine, but how the company ought to exist uh, and how sales ought to run its function and how marketing ought to produce things and how we should manage field service and training. He had an amazingly great overall picture of how things should be, and he had the calm and the personal strength to make it come true. Um, very rare did he actually get angry at stuff. Most of the time, he would listen to everyone's point of view. Um, we would talk a little about what we thought would make some sense. And when we couldn't come to an agreement ourselves, which he tried to let us do most of the time, he would then direct and say, okay, here's what everything is going on. And here's what you're going to do. Well, here's what I want you to do. And everybody would then leave that room happy that Dave picked the path, and now we're all going to go do that path, even if, if it wasn't the thing we personally wanted at the time. He just made it work. Um, yes, Jay had a lot of great internal architectural concepts, especially in the silicon. Uh, the architecture of the silicon and the amazing cleverness in which things that ordinarily couldn't have been done in those days, uh, there isn't enough amps to put in the power supply. There isn't enough space on the silicon. There's never enough nanoseconds. He created some really cool stuff um, that was on the inside. I learned a lot from Jay. It was amazing. It was the first silicon I ever did. I'd never done a silicon until then. And he taught me how. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, but the overall family of how things go together, uh, Dave Morse would watch and would pick. He picked who came to the company and who didn't. Um, it was very good. He did a great job of keeping us in good shape. And then he helped us deal with people that weren't so great. Uh, there were times when somebody would show up and we'd hire them and, you know, this wasn't a good idea. Uh, but, and not from a technology standpoint, but from a personality and a flavor and a warmness and who they were as a person. Um, and so Dave, I, I credit him with keeping the team flowing and together and feeling that whole familiness that kept us doing things that, as you had said, 
might have been a conscious effort, but I don't think it was. I think it was the natural flow of the people and the team that came together. It was bringing the right personalities together by the sounds of it. That's very interesting. Wow. Yeah. Do you think the Amiga achieved everything that you guys had set out? Because, and I kind of ask that from the point of view that, you know, certainly I can tell you in Europe, it's remembered. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of like people yeah. know what it what it is. I mean, that may not be the same from an American perspective, but certainly from a outside the US sort of perspective, and even Canada, actually. Um, do you think it achieved everything that you'd set out to do? Um, that's a very personal question. It'll be a different answer from person to person. Uh, for me, it did not. Uh, in America, it ought to have made the new standard for user interface. It had things that were, we had a Mac also at the time, then we got a Lisa, it was very funny to look at the Lisa. Um, but Amiga's user interface could easily have become the clear leader. Um, the multiple screens, the things you could do on your screen, uh, real color, uh, so many things. Uh, multitasking, true multitasking, not the halfway junk of the other machines. Um, it could have been the thing that made computing for the planet so much smoother, so much nicer. Lots of people that would never touch a computer because they don't want to learn how would have an Amiga because they didn't have to learn how. Uh, you opened it up, you clicked, it was obvious, you saw what to do, it just did it right. Um, and that's what I was looking for Amiga to do. I wanted immense performance because a lot of things you can't do correctly if you don't have massive performance. And we were on our way. Uh, we needed a lot more memory, but that was expensive back then. So we had to work a deal out that got us enough memory. And that would have changed over the years without trouble. Just as the prices got better, we would have had more memory. Processors were getting faster, and that would have been easy enough to melt into everything we did. So none of those were issues in terms of evolution and growth. It was the user interface that was a world ahead, uh, alien to this planet, um, that I think was the legacy that should have been Amiga. Here's how you compute. Here's how you aim. Here's how you do homework. Here's how you investigate the world around you. Here's how you make tools so that your life is more productive, better, more fun, more time with your family, more things you can do together. Play it on a TV set as TV sets got bigger and bigger. Um, it's That was the path for me. That's what I wanted. And because Commodore killed it, we never got there. And do you think there's stuff from the interface? Because I, I actually find this a very interesting point because I'm still trying to get my, my head around the interface in terms of going back to the impact of having an interface like that then to like, you know, because it seems as though Windows 95 pretty much was 10 years after what the Amiga had done. You know, it was definitely yeah. easily 10 years ahead of its game. Um, so coming back to that, would you say that there's still things now that have not been implemented that were implemented in the Amiga? Technically, yes. Metaphorically, probably not. I mean, you can have a lot of open windows. And you in Amiga, you could do a lot of that with screens. And on a PC, you can do similar stuff. You just don't need to because the multiple simultaneously operating windows works. Um, real multitasking sort of now works. Uh, it's not as good as it was on the Amiga back then. Carl was a genius. Um, but it's just, uh, it is stuff that's doable now on the other machines, even though it's not done the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, mouse clicks, still okay. Um, PCs and Macs do them somewhat differently, and when I have to bounce back and forth, it's interesting to remember what's supposed to work. Um, so I think that, Technically, specifically, item by item, there are things that didn't make their way into modern computing, but there's other functions in modern computing that do the same job. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I find it interesting because certainly sort of going back and now knowing sort of hardware and software a lot more from the technical angle now than I did before, although I always had an interest in it. Um, I find it interesting that you kind of, you created in a different generation of computing what is there now. And it was from being resourceful in terms of how to, like you were saying about the memory and stuff, how to be resourceful in terms of information flow and how to make it work with what you had at that time. Modern day computers do a lot of stuff brute force. Yeah. They don't care that it takes extra power. They don't care that it takes tons of memory uh, because memory is cheap and power got cheap. So um, instead of being resourceful 
and doing 20 times the amount of useful work um, in a particular chunk of memory or power, they waste that memory and power because it's cheap. And when I talk to software guys about that, their answer is, well, you know, i got to finish the program. i got to develop this and get that out the door and go sell my next one. And they're right. They do have to do that. Uh, it's just sad that it takes a gigabyte to run an engineering program now when it used to take a quarter megabyte. So a guy by the name of Christian Stephenson at uh, Google actually did um, a Chrome viewer of the Amiga 500 of Amiga DOS. I was wondering oh, I didn't whether. Know. Yeah, yeah. You can check it out online. I was just want. I mean, I'm going to ask RJ this as well because he'll probably know. I was just wondering whether that was to do with the the connection to to RJ and stuff like that. Because I'm assuming this guy is pretty much from Europe. So I'm just wondering what his influence was to do that, and whether, you know, similar to me, we were people that were tinkering with this stuff when we were, you know, when we were growing up. So that 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 that, that was the last question I was going to ask you before I leave you. Really. I don't know him. I okay. Don't know. Cool. Well, I mean, for now, thank you for your time, Dave. Um, if possible, if I need to talk to you again when I'm rejigging things, I'd really appreciate that. Sure, call whenever you want. Yeah, great, fantastic. Um, yeah, and I mean, I'd just like to say, you know, thank you for everything that you've done. You know, for somebody that now lives in the U.S. but comes from Britain, you know, I can let you know that certainly I was of that generation where, you know, the generation of things like the the Atari Lynx, the 3DO, the Amiga, that was my generation of computing, so to speak, you know, and I really... How old were you when you first, when you first saw Amiga? So I have memories of the Amiga from the age of, I'd say probably 10 or 11. So I, rem wow. I, remember, I remember the Amiga 500, but I actually, I've still, I mean, I've still got an Amiga 1200 now, but it's the, it's the SCOM relaunch version. But the Amiga, yeah. 12, the Amiga 1200 was the one that really hit home because when... When that came out, there was such a there was such an incredible sort of gaming presence in the UK for the Amiga yeah. that it was just it was such a massive system. I mean, I sent you some links via email a little while ago, but if you check out two programs, uh, one called Games Master, and I can send you the link for that, and one called Bad Influence, which was more of a computer science stroke video gaming uh, program aimed at children of that time. The Amiga was just a constant on it. They, I mean, but also as well, you had Atari Lynx being reviewed on there. They reviewed Batman Returns, for instance, which is the game I remember on the Atari Lynx. And they also basically have like the 3DO launch and things like that as well. And there's actually there's actually an interview on that program where they go to Electronics Art, Arts as the 3DO was being developed. So it wow. was, yeah, so that's what I'm just saying. In terms of perception, it was absolutely massive in the UK. Wow. Basically how much, yeah, the demand was massive. That's that's why it amazes me. The d demand was that in Britain in particular, demand was absolutely huge, and then Germany again was just another on another scale. Still an Amiga magazine going called Amiga Future, and that's actually based out of Germany. There's one; it's printed in German and it's printed in English to give you an wow. idea of yeah. So so it's left a sizable print, you know. It's left a sizable print. Yeah. So I live in Alameda, um, and we have uh, in our city government a closed TV system that they put the various government functions on on one of the channels on the local TV. Yep. Um, they run that with an Amiga and a toaster. And in the a, a long time ago, it used to be great fun because the system would crash and everyone in the city who was watching that city function television would get to see guru meditation uh, on their TV screen. And it was hysterical because no one had a clue what that was, but I would laugh when I go to that channel and it would be saying guru meditation. I loved it. Just hysterical. Uh, and then eventually they swapped it out for something else, but for many, many tens of years, it was an Amiga. Hello there, my name's Adam Spring, and I'm here to talk to you about a number of ways in which you can stay connected with and contribute to the Remotely Interested podcast. As I've said before, it's listener-supported, and I love to include you guys as, as much as I can. Anyway... The big two are iTunes and SoundCloud, which you can subscribe to. Also for SoundCloud, you can follow, you can like, you can share. You can do a number of things with the content that I put up there. There's also Google Play where you can check this podcast out. And there's also a Facebook page that you can like. Now, in terms of connecting with me directly, there's a Twitter handle, which is at that interested. You can also follow and reach out to me there. And there's also the remotely interested email as well, which is contact at remotely-interested.com. Anyway, I love doing this for you. I hope you enjoy it, and thanks for listening to the show.
the acorn? No, I'm not. I don't remember what year it was. We'd have to go look it up. But I go to work at Apple. And the project that gets assigned to me is to take a look at this new interesting concept of a risk machine from some British company. So this is the Archimedes then? Um, I don't remember what it might have been called in front of it. But prior to that actual assignment, my boss gives me a different assignment. And he says, I want to create a new processor different from what's been hanging around out there with a different kind of instruction set. I want it to be a reduced instruction set. I want it to be a simple instruction set. And I want it to run as fast as we can possibly make it run. And we have to be able to build it with the facilities that are currently related to Apple. So I already knew about risk machines back then, and I had my own feelings about what simplicity really needed to be. And so I designed, I architected a small processor that had a very simple set of instructions um, and had a simple clocking mechanism and had no complications of any kind. And one of the things that it did have that I liked a lot was the speed of memory at that time was pretty much the same as the speed of the bus that I was putting on this processor. And so we would be keeping up with the fast memories. And I knew as memory got faster, the processors would get faster. Stuff just gets faster as it goes along. So I architect this processor for my boss at Apple. I'm trying to remember his name. He was a French guy. Anyway, and the other engineer working on the team, a software guy that was cool, he was a French kid. He turned out to be really cool, too, and I just can't remember his name either. Anyway, so I do this, and then we go to VTI, which was the foundry that was making some chips for Apple. And I show them my architecture, and we ask them to help us design the chip. I mean, to fab the chip. We're going to go figure out the silicon and stick it all in their tool set and make this chip. And after the guy looks from VTI, after he looks at my chip, he says, um, I want you to take a look at this other processor first. And my boss says, okay, and they sign whatever they have to sign. And he shows us the new arm out of Acorn, brand new processor concept that these guys are just now making in the VTI tools. And it's so close to what I just did, it's like astonishing. And it's better than what I did, and it's closer to being finished. And so we dumped my architecture, and we moved our system over to the arm after my boss says, go figure out what's going on. Go look at the acorn. Go look at the other machine they already have. I don't remember his name. It's the Archimedes, I think. And so we, instead of doing that, we take the arm, and we make uh, an 8 megahertz, I think it was 8 megahertz, uh, arm-based machine for Apple. Um, it takes us a remarkably small amount of time to do it. It was astonishingly easy to do because the architecture of the arm was so nice. Um, we build our prototypes. It's one of the guys writes a software emulator for Apple II. And so Apple II software is running fast on my tiny little architecture machine. Um, and it's full color. And we do some uh, Mac type, what was it, Mac or something else, some color stuff. I forgot what it was called. I can't remember the names. Anyway, we do all this junk. Then one of the guys from Apple says, hey, I got this new concept of a touch panel. And he's got an LCD thing, and he's going to make a tablet way back then. Um, and they picked the arm because they were able to run some kind of handwriting recognition software on our super high-performance 8 megahertz machine. It was kind of silly. Uh, and about then, the Apple II GS is getting ready to come out. And Apple management votes for the 2GS instead of the ARM machine we just did. And they shell the ARM machine. The 2GS comes out. I'm pissed and I quit. Well, I was involved with the ARM. Um, as soon as I started using it, it was great. I used it in lots of little things. <laughs> when we did NTG, and then which turned into 3DO, the processor was an ARM. And we, I forgot what speed we were initially running at. And it was the idiots from that took over NTG. I'm sorry, it took over and made 3DO that insisted the ARM had no future. They felt the company was going to die. There would be no support for the processor, and they weren't going to commit to the two years of development and software and everything we already had that worked just fine on ARM, and went instead to a power PC. 